with the way Elijah stepped up when you came in. He did a hell of a job. I thought he did a real good job. I mean, that's kind of what, was, um, what we expected him to do. And um, But it's always tough in your first game and stuff. And uh, he went in there and didn't hesitate and uh, ran the ball well. It's ne next man up, and um, we expect those guys to um, not miss a beat. The lone back is Elijah Mitchell. Toss right side behind the tight end. Flags are down. Mitchell into the secondary. Breaks a tackle. Touchdown! San Francisco! Well, that was fast. Raheem Mostert only got two carries in the 2021 season before he went down for the year, leaving a massive opportunity for someone to step into his role and provide huge fantasy value for the rest of the season. In week one, that someone was unknown rookie Elijah Mitchell, who came into the year with no hype at all as a late round draft pick who was assumed to be at the very bottom of the depth chart. Well, 19 carries, 104 yards, and a sweet 38 yard touchdown later, Mitchell became the clear cut number one waiver wire pickup in every league format. Now, if you've been playing fantasy football for any amount of time, you already know that there is insane production to be found in the 49ers backfield. However, you also already know that it's easy to get burned by trying to guess which running back is going to get that production week to week. Kyle Shanahan has never used a season long bell cow in his backfield. And in 2020, we saw five different running backs run as the lead back at some point in the season. So what do we do with Elijah Mitchell? Should we be selling high if we own him? Or if we don't own him, should we be trying to buy him low before the price goes up? Is he just another 49ers running back whose good weeks will be impossible to predict? Or is that narrative even completely true in the first place? What's up guys? Before I get into the video, I just really wanted to say thank you for the response that I got from my Tyson Williams breakdown video. There was some really good advice in the comments, both here on YouTube and on the Reddit post I made. Also, just the response in general was super encouraging. You guys had a lot of really nice things to say and it's just really rewarding because these videos, they take a lot of work and a lot of time and it just feels great to see that people are enjoying them and it feels great to see the channel starting to grow. It's feedback like that that really makes me excited to keep grinding on this channel and I have my sights set on 10,000 subscribers. So thank you guys again for helping make that possible. Also, I wanted to get this video out as fast as possible and I really wish that it could have been out before waivers cleared on Wednesday, but I didn't want to rush it and just half-ass the video. I have a Reddit post that goes up every Tuesday morning with these write-ups that cover all of the top waiver pickups of the week and links to my every play videos. And for me to make all those videos, do all the research and make all those write-ups, it just takes a ton of time. So for me to have all that done plus this video out by Tuesday, I would have just had to be on crack and not sleeping at all or I would have had to rush this video out half-baked. Yo, can you chill back there, bro? I'm trying to record. So that being said, I'm here now, and the task at hand, Elijah Mitchell. So first things first, let's jump right into the game film. So the core aspect of Mitchell's game is his speed. The 49ers actually first used him in the preseason as a returner, and he showed off his wheels right away in that role. Speed was always his calling card back in college where he maintained a six yards per carry average over four seasons at Louisiana Lafayette. His pro day numbers were also impressive in terms of his speed and he actually profiled pretty closely to the guy he just replaced in week one, Raheem Mostert. They're the same height, the same weight, and basically have the same speed measurables. Now that might be sacrilege to say since Mostert might have the fastest top end speed of any running back in the league right now, but we all saw what happened in week one when Mitchell saw some daylight and this running scheme is going to provide plenty of daylight. Mitchell runs through contact. He just does. It's something that he did really well in college. In fact, one season he led his conference in yards per carry after contact. Now that was the Sun Belt Conference, so with that level of competition it's kind of hard to say whether that would translate to the pro level, but based on what we've seen so far, it is translating. He runs with a really low center of gravity and he runs into contact fully expecting to get through it every time. This means that anybody using poor form or trying to arm tackle him, they're not going to get him down. And Mitchell consistently falls forward for extra yards, even when a lot of other running backs might just give up on a play or even get knocked backwards. His size and his running style make it rare that he'll ever really truck NFL defenders, but he's no pushover and he's definitely durable enough to take some heavy shots and still pop right back up.
So speed and toughness aside, the one thing that stands out to me the most with Mitchell and the thing that I think is really the most important aspect in terms of him getting work in this offense is his understanding of the run scheme and his willingness to stick to his assignment. I've seen plenty of comments from people this past week saying, oh, Detroit just sucks. He's not special. He was just taking what the defense gave him. Guys, that's not a given. There are plenty of running backs who can't take what the defense gives them because they don't have the vision to see what's there to be taken, or they don't have the discipline to trust the blocking and stick to the game plan. Dancing around in the backfield looking for a hole is one of the fastest ways to get yourself benched as a young running back. It's right up there with fumbling and getting your quarterback blown up on a missed block. In this running scheme especially, the running back needs to be decisive and disciplined. He can't just sit around waiting for holes to open up whenever he feels like it. I mean, just listen to what the 49ers offensive coordinator had to say about Mitchell's week one performance. We, we like running backs that um, what you could see on what you could see on college film that you saw last Sunday is he has very good v vision and he has a natural feel for negotiating with blockers. You know, there's a lot of running backs out there that you know they see space and they just cut right to it. Um, it's important in our offense to, to press the line of scrimmage and press blockers and he did that very well. He had speed. He um, he ran violently and got yards after contact. So that's kind of the common de denominator um, with, with all the running backs that we're really looking for. And uh, he, you could really see, you saw the same type of stuff that you, last Sunday on his Louisiana Lafayette tape. It was just, it was a little grainier tape. So with that being said, Mitchell showed in week one that he is a perfect fit for this run scheme. After all, it was pretty much the same run scheme that he ran in all four seasons of college. In week one, he always knew his assignment and he always followed his assignment, almost to a fault. This could have actually been a monster, monster week for Mitchell had he been a bit more risky and trusted his own legs on a couple of outside zone runs. I'll give you guys a couple examples. So in this play, the 49ers are running a toss play to the right and they're starting from the left hash. So there's a ton of open space on the right side of the field. At this point of the play in his zone run scheme, Mitchell has the option to do one of the three B's, bend, bang, or bounce. Bend as in bend it back or cut back. Bang as in bang the run right through the designed running lane, which in this case would be right behind use check. Or bounce as in bounce it to the outside, try to get the edge and run down the sideline. Now I really wish that Mitchell had chose to bounce it here because if you look at the key blocks in the play here, McGlinchey has his guy taken care of, Kittle and Juszczyk are just finishing a double team on the edge defender and Juszczyk is about to move up to the second level and grab that defender, and Debo has his guy completely covered. In this case, I think Mitchell was kind of falling victim to the context here. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that this is basically the second play of the second half, and the 49ers are up 21 points. There's really no need to do anything risky on a first and 10 on this spot of the field. So I think Mitchell here is just trying to play it safe. Even though he could have bounced it to the outside, he decides to go with bang and he just follows his block right through the middle of the pile. Had he not stumbled here, I think he could probably pick up a handful more yards, but a small gain on first and 10, there's nothing wrong with that. I think this was a case of him just not wanting to risk losing five yards on a first and 10 when there was really no need to risk it. Here we have basically the same exact situation. It's a toss play to the right, starting from the left half, so there's a ton of space. This time they're really backed up right in front of their own end zone, and I think, again, Mitchell falls victim to the context of the situation. It's first and 10, you're backed up right in front of your own end zone. By the time he gets the toss, he's like six feet in front of his own goal line. He doesn't want to do anything risky, they're up 21 points. But look at the blocking on this play. None of the backside defenders have a shot to stop this play in the backfield. Again, right tackle McGlinchey has his guy taken care of. George Kittle is mauling his guy. Debo is actually free to take on the DB that's hanging out on the left side of the screen. We just can't see him. And this is the key block right here, this tight end. If this tight end right here, Charlie Warner, had a bit of a better block, I think Mitchell takes it to the outside. And honestly, he's going to be one-on-one -on -one with the safety. I think he breaks his ankles and we see potentially a 91-yard touchdown. And then there's no discussion about what to do with this guy in fantasy. If Warner's butt is facing the sidelines and he has that defender sealed off from the outside lane, or even if he has his butt more pointing towards the end zone, I think Mitchell takes that shot of running around him. But the fact that 
it looks as though that defender could shed the block and take Mitchell down at his own five yard line. He just doesn't want to risk that right now in this context. So again, he chooses bang and he runs through the design run lane for a solid gain of seven yards. But choosing the bang option is probably the technically correct move here, because if you look at the center, Alex Mack is already five yards downfield mauling his defender and everyone else is on their blocking assignment as well. So running through the middle is probably the safest and also the smartest move. And I'm sure it's one that the coaches are looking at in the film room right now saying, Eli, we really love that you did this, but next time, take that chance, hit that edge, trust your speed. Now here's an example where Mitchell actually did decide to bounce to the outside, but if he had committed a little bit harder to the outside, I think he could have had a monster run here as well. The 49ers are running an inside zone run this time, and he, Mitchell is supposed to be following Debo. With the box stacked pretty heavily, bang isn't really an option here, and Mitchell sees this and he does the right thing to bounce it to the outside, but he doesn't really take an extreme angle. He does more of a shallow angle that allows him to convert the first down, but he gets tackled right away. If he had committed harder and bounced this further to the outside, it would have been up to this Lions defender to bring him down in space one-on-one, -on -one, and I like Mitchell's odds there. Here's an example where Mitchell decides to cut it back, and it's definitely the right call here by him. I just would have loved to have seen him swing for the fences on this run, but it just never would have happened given the context. Again, it's first and 10 around midfield, they're up 24 halfway through the fourth quarter. There's no reason for him to do anything risky, which is why he doesn't. But he showed, even on this play, that he had the burst to make a guy miss in space. So if he had decided to take a really aggressive outer cut, this could have been another huge run for him. And not only could he have gone for a more aggressive bounce on the front side of the play towards the designed edge, after he cuts it back, he has the opportunity to take a wider angle again and turn a good gain into a huge gain. He chooses not to, he goes for the technically correct option, and I'm sure the coaches love it, but this is encouraging stuff for me. I mean, look at the burst he shows here after the cut to have this defender grabbing at air. Even as it is on this play, if Sanu had just given a little bit more effort on his block, this could have been a huge play as well. So the analysis of Mitchell's skill set is really only half of the equation when we're talking about what Mitchell's fantasy value might be. The other half, which for a lot of people is the more important aspect, is whether or not we can expect Kyle Shanahan to use him in a way that's predictable. Because if you don't know when to start him, what's really the point? Now, this is not going to be a popular take, but in my opinion, the whole idea of the 49ers backfield just being completely impossible to predict week to week, it's just being completely overblown right now. Now, let me explain. Let's take a look at exactly what happened in 2020, week by week. And with hindsight being 2020, we can get a really good idea of what actually took place in the backfield and why 2021 is not going to be as confusing and hard to predict as a lot of people are saying it is. So I have some visual aids that are going to help me explain what happened, but before I show that, I just want to put down these two ground rules. Number one, Shanahan wanted to have a lead back. He wanted a guy to get a lot of the workload on any given week. If you take the opportunities that the lead back saw on each week and you average them out over the season, you get about 18 and a half opportunities per game to the lead back. Now that's not Christian McCaffrey levels of workload domination, but Pushing up against 20 opportunities per game in this offense, that's super valuable for a running back. Now the second ground rule is that when Mostert was playing, when he was healthy, he was that lead guy. He was the guy that Shanahan wanted to build the entire offense around. And the reason that 2020 got so muddied and hard to predict was because Mostert just wasn't able to stay healthy. In fact, the 49ers have got to be practicing on like a Native American burial ground or something because that running back room was just straight up cursed in 2020. and. It was pretty much just the massive amount of injuries they had that caused all that turnover in terms of who the lead guy was. So keeping those two rules in mind, we're going to go through 2020 week by week and go over who the lead back was, what the context was that week, and whether it was predictable who the lead guy was going to be the next week. So try not to get overwhelmed here by all of the numbers and the names, just focus on the colors. What we want to see is a lot of red with one green in each week because those show us that certain guys were involved while the rest were completely uninvolved and helped keep a clear picture in the backfield. Now, week one, Mostert was the guy, enough said. Week two, Mostert was the guy, except he got injured and Tevin Coleman took over to become the guy until he also got injured. 
Now, I want to take this time to say that from this point on, Tevin Coleman was completely irrelevant. He missed a bunch of weeks in a row with this knee injury, and he came back to get a tiny bit of snaps, only to miss more games with a re-injury to that knee, and then later he came back again to tiny amount of snaps. But the only time he had more than seven snaps in a game was right here in week two. So just to clear things up a bit and make it a more, bit more simple, we can just completely ignore Coleman from here on out. So going into week three, Mostert out, Coleman out. Hasty had just been called up from the practice squad with no NFL experience, and Wilson was coming off of an injury, so the consensus was that McKinnon was going to be the lead guy here, and he was, but actually both him and Wilson were productive. McKinnon had about 80 yards and a score, and Wilson had about 70 yards and a score. Now this is where some people will say that it became hard to predict, and obviously hindsight is 2020, but the signs were there as to who would be the lead guy in week 4. Both guys had good fantasy days, but McKinnon had more than double the snaps that Wilson had, and Wilson only had success really because he was in around the goal line. So in week 4, McKinnon was the lead guy, and he dominated the snap count. He logged 92% of the snaps, while Wilson only played 6 snaps. So while yes, anybody who thought that they could start Wilson in week 4 was super disappointed, but the lead guy was productive again, and the signs had been pointing to McKinnon being that lead guy. Now week 5 comes around and Mostert is back in the lineup. Remember the rule, when Mostert is healthy, Mostert is the lead guy. Week 6, again, Mostert is healthy, Mostert is the lead guy, until he got injured halfway through. Now since Wilson was out this game, McKinnon and Hasty split the remaining work, and this was the first time that Hasty got really any meaningful usage. Now in week 7, Wilson was back off his injury, and this is where I will put one up on the board for Shanahanigans for week 7. Based on what we had seen the last time Mostert was out, McKinnon should have been the lead guy, but instead, this time Wilson, coming fresh off of an injury, he got the lead role and he absolutely balled out. 120 total yards, 3 touchdowns, before unfortunately getting injured again, and this was the week that really pissed everybody off. People who had played McKinnon, they got burnt, and basically everybody had Wilson on their bench where he put up his best week of the season. I think this is the week, more than any other, that made people think this backfield is just too confusing. Now, week 8, Mostert out, Wilson out. Another week that people will claim was confusing, but again, the signs were definitely there. In week 7, McKinnon had just seen his season low in snaps, while Hasty had logged another notable workload, and he'd actually seen a slight increase from his week 6 workload. So in week 8, Hasty was the lead guy for the one and only time this season, and it's important to note here that he looked bad. Sure, he might have saved his fantasy day with a 1 yard score, but he averaged 2 yards per carry. On the other hand, McKinnon, coming off of his season low in snaps, he jumped up to his highest snap count in a month, and despite being out-touched by Hasty, he played on more snaps than him. Also, he was able to put up way more efficient production, so he was quickly back on the positive trend. Now week 9 comes around, and if you had been following the snap count trail, it hadn't led you wrong yet except that one week that Wilson exploded. And week 9 was more of the same, with McKinnon and Hasty being the only healthy guys, and McKinnon now on the uptrend and Hasty now on the downtrend, McKinnon got the lead role. Hasty's role in this game shrunk a lot from the previous week, so he was fading back into only being an emergency option. Coming into week 10, with the other three running backs still out and Hasty fading, McKinnon looked like the clear lead guy, and he was. Hasty also got hurt in this game, and he was out for the season, so now Coleman and Hasty are both completely irrelevant. Week 11 was the bye week. Week 12, Mostert was back, so Mostert was the guy. As a side note, with Wilson also back here in week 12, McKinnon saw his lowest snap count in a month, making it pretty clear that the McKinnon lead back experiment was over, as long as Mostert and Wilson were healthy. Also, this is where things get a little bit squirrely with the Mostert rule, because he wasn't actually healthy, he was playing through a high ankle sprain. Which brings us to week 13, which is the one and only time that the Mostert rule didn't hold true, because while Mostert did start and finish week 13, he wasn't actually the lead guy here. Wilson slightly outsnapped him, slightly outtouched him, and Mostert was on the injury report getting second opinions on what to do about his high ankle sprain. So now week 14, with the sanctity of the Mostert rule shattered, I can completely understand if owners would be confused about who the lead guy might be, but the Mostert rule held true here, Mostert was the lead guy again. Week 15, Mostert played, so Mostert was the lead guy, until he tragically got injured again. Wilson had been already playing way more snaps than McKinnon in the past few weeks, and here this week he filled in for Mostert with a heavy workload. Now week 16, Wilson was obviously going to be the lead guy, and he got the biggest workload of any 49ers running back so far in 2020. 
And finally, week 17, same exact story as week 16. It was all Wilson. So all in all, the way the workloads were distributed week to week was actually completely reasonable in hindsight. There were only two weeks that I would say are candidates for Shanahanigans, being week seven when Wilson came off an injury to get a monster workload in a monster game, and week 13 where Mostert was playing and he didn't leave the game to injury, but he was playing through an injury and his workload wasn't really great. The way people talk about Shanahan, you would think that there's literally no rhyme or reason in terms of who was going to be getting the workload. But looking back with the benefit of hindsight, his hand was basically always forced by injury. Also, following the trends in terms of the snap counts pretty consistently let us figure out who the lead guy was going to be filling in for those injuries. So with all of that being said, tediously, Shanahan wanted a lead guy. He wanted Mostert to be the lead guy every time he was healthy. And that's part of the main reason that I'm pretty optimistic about Mitchell this season. He fits the Mostert role most closely, so if he's healthy, I expect Shanahan to favor him to be the lead guy. Of course, Hasty will factor in, and Sermon and Wilson, whenever they get worked into the offense, they'll probably factor in a little bit too. But like we've seen, those other guys can get worked in all they want. The lead guy is still going to be the lead guy and have a ton of value. So to summarize my thoughts on Mitchell in terms of fantasy, I think you go out and you try to get this guy if you don't already have him. At least for the time being, I think he's the guy that Shanahan's going to try to build this running offense around. Jeff Wilson is out until at least week six, and who knows how quickly they integrate him back into the offense. And as far as Trey Sermon goes, he was not even active week one. Sure, the 49ers traded two picks to move up into the third and draft him and all that, but Shanahan doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care about draft day pedigree and all that crap, which is why he built his entire running offense around an undrafted guy who was cut by like six teams before he ended up on the 49ers. So if you already own Mitchell, I would just view him as if you own Mostert. And if you don't own Mitchell, maybe try to make a move to try to get him on your team if the guy who has him just views him as a trade chip and not a legit high-end, high-upside starter. The risky part of the 49ers backfield is where you're trying to figure out whether one of the backups is worth starting. But in terms of the lead guy, they're always worth starting. And for the time being, I think Mitchell is that lead guy. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, chuck a like on it. Consider subscribing to the channel. There's going to be a ton more content like this throughout the football season. On Sunday nights and all through Monday, you're going to see me posting my every play videos to the channel. Uh, focused on the guys who I think are going to be the top waiver wire pickups on that week, on that Wednesday. And also on every Tuesday morning, make sure you guys check out my Reddit post, which has links to all those videos, but also with pretty detailed write-ups for each player. You can find that post on usually on the front page of the Fantasy Football subreddit, or you can actually follow my Reddit account. That's actually a thing, and you can get notified whenever I make my posts. Thanks again for all the love, all the support, and I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you.